Hello everyone, welcome to this uh, webinar, part of the Campbell Webinar Series 2021. This is our first webinar on using middle level theory in mixed methods, a systematic review, the example of youth mentoring program. Howard, over to you. Okay, thanks Audrey. Can you stop sharing your screen, please? Yes. And, uh, Okay, welcome everybody. Um, there's still people arriving. Audrey, please keep, to, keep to letting them in. Um, this is a Zoom meeting, not a Zoom webinar. So you are free to unmute yourselves and shout obscenities, but please don't do that. Um, so please do stay muted um, throughout the meeting. If you have questions at any point, please enter in the chat box. So we'll take all questions at the end. Um, as Audrey said, this is the first meeting of the and this is the first webinar in the Campbell webinar series 2021. This uh, webinar series is supported by the American Institutes for Research, so thank you to them for that. And today's is a presentation on the topic of middle level theory and application in particular to designing systematic reviews, but also designing interventions and primary studies. So let me get my screen up. So you should now be seeing the, um, the PowerPoint slide. Thank you. So let's talk about what, uh, what mentoring programs are to start with, and I'll say a bit about middle level theory and, and then go on to the application to mentoring programs. So first of all, a very quick um, pop quiz. Here are four films. What do all these films have in common? So what all these films have in common is that all features films featuring a young person being mentored by an adult. So from ballet and Billy Elliot to martial arts and karate kid to a futuristic last person found in battle in Hunger Games to a potential delinquent being trained, being a top agent to top secret service in, uh, in um, what's called Kingsman. They're all, they've all got this idea of a mentor as a guide, a role model, as a motivator in all four of those movies. And that's basically all middle range theory is about. You can, you can go home now and make some tea or something. Because the basic idea of middle range theory is you've got a, a common core principle, a, a causal idea or a theory, but applies across different settings. And so this idea of a mentor is, is a very key one. It, as, as we see, it features very commonly in fiction, not just in, in films, but in books and so on, but also often in, in in real life, we hear real life stories of success. People have turned their lives around from disadvantaged backgrounds. It's, it's nearly always the case they mention some key adult who was a supporter. It could be a grandparent, it could be a priest, it could be an athletics coach, someone that played a key role in their transformation from a youth from a disadvantaged background into someone who actually had a, a very uh, su successful life. And that's the basic idea behind mentoring programs. Um, middle level theory, let's talk a bit about that. So the idea of middle level theory is it, it's, it's something different to a normal theory of change. And I've been working with middle level theory for a while now in a, in a different research program I work on called SEDO, I won't talk much about that here, um, and have developed application middle range theory in a number of different areas. And I'm trying now to apply it to um, mentoring for youth delinquency, and I'm, I'm getting there. I haven't got there. So um, if, if I might give this presentation another six months time, it'll be, be different because I hope to have got there by then. Um, but I have got quite a long way in, in developing a theory of change, which is moving toward middle level principles. Um, and so the idea is that a, a specific theory of change, I'm sure we're all familiar with the idea, shows us how you programs, inputs and activities gets converted to outputs and outcomes. So in this case, how's mentoring reduce youth delinquency? And that theory of change, we're all familiar with that. Um, but a theory of change is normally drawn for specific intervention. So for example, have reach out and groundwork our mentoring programs in England, and you could do a theory of change for either of those programs. Whereas the idea of a middle level theory is it's, it's, it's stated at a sufficiently general level that can actually apply across a range of settings. So just like the idea of an adult mentor applied across ballet and martial arts, it can, it, it, the idea of a mentoring program can apply in different settings in, in the US or the UK or in South Africa or in, in India. Um, but even though the context and specifics of the programs will be different. 
The idea of middle level theory comes from Merton, a sociologist writing in the 50s and 60s. And the Merton's rationale was a lot of sociological theory was too abstract to actually be useful. You couldn't actually, it couldn't, it did not, that could not be the basis for deriving test, empirically testable propositions. And so he wanted to move to theories that actually identified social constructs which could be measured and therefore propositions about the relationship between those social constructs could be tested empirically. And, and that's the idea, basically. So it sits behind the lot point three here. Middle-level middle level theory sits between a theoretical empiricism and um, a, a grand theory. So a theoretical empiricism has actually become quite common with the rise of randomized control trials. A lot of randomized control trials take what's called a black box approach, just do intervention X, at least to outcome Y. We don't know why. And defenders of, of randomized control trials, people as to flow, so we don't need to. She has said this. I'm not making it up. We don't need to know why. That's that's actually people say oh, RCTs can't handle complexity. They don't care about complexity. It doesn't matter. We just know if we do X, it leads to Y. Don't we don't know why? We don't need to know why. We just know just know that this works. I've, I've also written on this and said well, the black box can be a blessing, not a curse. Under those circumstances, we've really got complexity. You can't. You can't, un can't necessarily untangle. Um, so you've got this atheoretical empiricism of a lot of randomized control trials, not all, but a lot. And then you've got this grand theory where you make grand statements, but actually there's nothing empirically testable there. You're trying to get in this in mid level. In, in work we've done in this, I'm not presenting here today, the, the middle is quite big. It can go quite a range of statements, some of which sound quite specific, and others will sound really quite general and so there's no precise location for this middle and hopefully as we do more work on this in this particular area um, this will be will clear up. so why do we do middle level theory so the idea is i haven't put it on the slide but underpinning both of these concepts of why we use middle level theory is that middle level theory is an approach to transferability that's the the reason why i got engaged in working on um, middle level theory is that people are increasingly interested in the issue of transferability sometimes they say generalizability but i distinguish between generalizability and transferability a generalizable statement is universally true all times all places not many things will be that in social sectors whereas a transferable state transferable evidence statement is one that's transferred from one setting one context one time place to another setting, another time and place. That's a far more realistic thing to, to aim for. Um, and so that helps inform program design. So, well, here is a, here's a set of findings from a particular study and applying a mid-level theory framework allows me to transfer those findings from that setting to this setting. And we'll, we'll see examples of this in a moment. Um, and also it helps you think about evaluation questions uh, for both primary studies and reviews. So what sort of question do I want to be answered that can help me understand how this thing is, this intervention is working, so how transferable my findings about the intervention will be to, to other settings. So the framework provides the question, but also helps think about transferability. But I don't talk much about transferability in, in this presentation, but it does underpin the two main reasons why we want to do use middle level theory is, is program design and, and designing, working out evaluation questions. So here's a, an example of a mid-level causal principle, providing people information about the benefits of adopting certain behaviour or the harm of not doing so, increase the likelihood of behaviour being adopted. And you can apply that to public health campaigns, or exercise and, and diet, to road safety campaigns, anti-smoking. Most interventions actually at some point provide information to people and often in this exhaustive manner, exhaustive manner about just do this is good for you or don't do that, it's bad for you. Um, and so the middle level principle is simply budding information about certain behavior, increases likelihood of that behavior being adopted. And that is clearly empirically testable, and you would test it under, in specific circumstances, road safety, anti-smoking, and so on, but would hope to be able to draw the lessons you learn from that to other settings, other types of campaign. But for a causal principle like this one to, to operate, they're actually underlying assumptions. And this is a key thing in theory of change. And if I, I'm not a 
great person on mind about semantics. I don't get hung up on how the log frame differs to a theory of change. But if I am pushed to say how's a log frame different to a theory of change, I think the theory of change stresses more on the assumptions, the underlying assumptions we need to hold for the causal principles in the theory of change to operate. And so in the middle-level theory approach, we do stress on the importance of looking at the underlying assumptions, underlie the causal process we identify in the middle-level theory. And um, there are, in say, in, there are classifications of those um, underlying assumptions as being safeguards and um, derailers, derailers being things that might stop the causal process happening, safeguards being things we put in place to prevent that causal process from being disrupted, derailed, and so on. I'm not using that framework here, it's in some of the references I'll provide at the end, but the key point about looking at underlying assumptions is critical in any, any theory of change, in any middle-level theory. So the first assumption, when you tell someone, we're well, looking here at this causal principle, that telling people to do something is good for them, they'll, they'll, they'll just likely them doing it. Um, but actually, before I go on to this one, I do say increase for the likelihood. So one criticism of people like me is that we're unduly positivist. And, we're, and, and positivism there is mistaken for determinism. And that, that's incorrect, because all, all statements we make are probabilistic statements. So there's no, there's no vac even vaccines don't work 100%, but certainly there's no vaccine in social interventions. No intervention has a guaranteed result. It only increases the probability of certain behavior, the probability of improving certain outcomes. And that's certainly the case here. So first assumption, I'm going to have four assumptions on this, on this providing information uh, uh, causal process. The first one is behavior not already adopted. So an early theory-based impact evaluation carried out by the World Bank. The examples I'm giving now come from different sectors in development. Um, the examples, uh, uh, Agriculture Extension Program in Kenya found that the extension works were going out and telling farmers to adopt practices those farmers actually were already adopting. So of course the extension program had no impact on farming practices because they were doing what they were being told to do. So it had no impact on yields, um, incomes and, and so on because of the first problem, the, the assumption that underlied the principle of giving people advice on what to do is they're not already doing what they're telling them to do. And that, that was violated here. So there's a particular finding in a particular study of agricultural extension in Kenya, which is that farmers, there was no impact because farmers were already doing the practice being promoted. But the mid-level principle is in order for behavior change communication to have an effect, desired population, desired behavior is not already adopted in the target population. So that's a mid-level statement. It sounds like common sense, but anyone who works in the evaluation knows that intervention after intervention fails because of things that just seem obvious once you've done the evaluation. The benefit hindsight is, is really great, but things often uh, don't go right because they've got these, these shortcomings in them. Um, I'll have a point on testing all of these slides. I think I'll skip that. The application to mentoring um, could well be you want to target youth who don't have an existing adult who might act as a mentor because they might have a good family environment, they might have a, an adult through sports or through school who acts as a mentor. So you're really looking to target children that don't already have someone that can play this mentoring role. Otherwise, the benefits won't be there uh, in the same way that it will be for a child that does have a mentor. The second assumption, again, an example from agricultural extension or farmer training, is uh, that it's possible to adopt the intervention. So an impact evaluation of trainings in an irrigated agriculture, an a training program for farmers is in Armenia, um, to use irrigated agriculture had no effect because active irrigation infrastructure hadn't been built. So you're training farmers to use irrigation, but there was no irrigation available. And so the middle level principle there is if you tell people to form an action X, any complementary input necessary to form action X must be available and accessible. Again, obvious, but again, many interventions fail because this assumption doesn't hold. Um, in the mentoring example, um, an example, just an example, would be the mentor promotes better school engagement, encourages the mentee to go really make an effort at school and engage with the school. The school needs to be open to, to respond to those efforts rather than to, to have written them off already and, and not really respond positively to these efforts. The um, 
Third assumption is it's beneficial to adopt the intervention. So you tell people to do things that actually are, are good for them. I think I haven't got the general statement here on this slide, but the general principle is tell people to do things that are actually going to be good for them. Um, so a study I was doing in self-help groups, so women's groups, in Andhra Pradesh in India, found that the women being recommended to undertake productive investments, it was actually a, a, a nursery for, for, for seedlings, for trees, um, was inherently loss-making, inherently going to lose money from the scheme just from the way the scheme had to operate. And so it wasn't a sensible thing for them, for them to do, as, as they found out to their cost. So for, for, for mentoring, actually, the main challenge here is for the mentee to believe in the intervention is going to be beneficial. So as we'll see later, there's a lot of attrition in mentoring programs, including initial refusal to take part by the, the children assigned to mentoring programs. And so they have to actually, it's not whether it's beneficial or not, they have to believe it's going to be beneficial in order to take part. Next is underlying assumption is that um, the communication is conducted in the appropriate way and through appropriate channels. This is, again, a really common problem. I don't think it applies only to developing countries where these examples are coming from. So we did a systematic review of farmer field schools, again, agriculture extension, a lot of examples of agriculture extension here. Um, and it's found that extension workers don't often speak the local language. There are over 2,000 languages spoken across Africa, probably more, because there are 400 in, in Nigeria alone. So most Africans speak more than one language, but it's beneficial to be able to speak the most common language that's used in the area where you're working. And that's really often not the case across public services, not just agriculture extension, but across health services, education services, and so on. Teachers can't speak the language that's used by the children in their homes uh, that, they're, that, they're, that they're teaching. And so the, the application of mentoring there, I'm not gonna say about language, though it may apply, is about the rapport between the mentor and the mentee. So the quality of the mentor-mentee relationship really is one of the most crucial variables in the, in the causal chain um, for effective mentoring programs. It comes up in, in, in being mentioned in evaluations, not actually in the reviews so much, um, but in the primary studies gets mentioned. It's, it's clearly critical for this mentoring process to work. So that's the view of um, Middle level theory, just like presenting the idea of here's a general statement of causal principle, but there are lots of assumptions underlying that. And you can evaluate whether those assumptions hold or not to understand why a causal process may work or may operate or not operate. Now, there are different types of mentoring program. And mentoring programs can be adult mentoring or peer mentoring. So peer mentoring, obviously, by, by children who are normally a year or two older than the, uh, the child being mentored, but they are also, also children. So the year above or two years above or something. Common schools, universities, and so on. But the focus here is on our adult mentoring. The um, second uh, distinction between one-on-one -on -one or group mentoring. So most of the programs we've looked at are one-on-one -on -one mentoring, but group mentoring is becoming more popular and clearly might well be more cost-effective if it has similar size effects then it'd be more cost effective to group mentoring rather than one on mentoring. And one can imagine actually through the peer interaction that group mentoring might be more effective than um, one on one mentoring. But at the same time, the, the group, if the group uh, dynamic might have, to have counterproductive effects through the dynamic of the group or might dilute the mentoring relationship. So it may not be as effective, may even be counterproductive. And so, so obviously a research question, which is more effective. But most of the studies we're looking at here, we've looked at are on one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Then the distinction between natural or informal mentoring and, and formal mentoring programs. So natural mentoring or informal mentoring happens, so we're talking about outside the home, clearly parental, parents are important role models and mentors. By mentoring, we mean people who are not, um, are not part of the um, family. So, but there's a lot of natural mentors who are sports coaches, teachers, religious figures, and, and so on. And then there's formal mentoring where children are enrolled in a mentoring program and assigned a mentor, like Big Brothers, Big Sisters in the US is the biggest, best known uh, mentoring program globally. And so we're concerned here with formal mentoring, not informal mentoring programs. But actually, you think back to the films I started with. So, Hunger Games is a formal mentoring process. Whereas Billy Elliot is and uh, Karate Kid is an informal, informal mentoring process. So you've got this distinction there. 
And five is structured versus unstructured. And so unstructured mentoring is, it's, it's, a it's a mentoring program. You meet a mentor once a week for an hour or two, you go, go to a sports game, you go to a cafe and chat, you do various activities, but there's no formal structured curriculum. In structured mentoring, there's actually a curriculum to be followed, which might be remedial education around maths and English, for example. It might be more therapeutically oriented. It varies from program to program. But uh, one of the key issues is the difference in effects between structured versus unstructured mentoring programs, and clearly, again, cost effectiveness, because structured programs will cost more. If they have larger effects, they might be more cost effective. And the jury is really out on that one because there's two recent reviews, including some of the same authors, that contradict one another on the relative merits of using structured versus unstructured um, programs. So now let's look at different, different versions of theory of change. So here's a very simple theory of change. You have inputs, which allow to activities, lead to outputs, get intermediate outcomes, and final outcomes. This is of no use whatsoever because a the theory of change needs to be specific to the intervention. I only put this there because I used to, to run a grant mapping agency called 3IE where we funded primary studies and reviews and we required that our grantees in the submissions elaborate the theory of change for the intervention they're going to evaluate and this is what we got. Many of our proposals had this and nothing else, just, just this. Here's our theory of change. So as I say, this is, this is useless and uh, don't do this. Um, I'm just flagging it as something not to do, not as copy this down, take a screenshot and put this in something else. Do not do, not do this. Um, this is a bit better. All these things are very possible using the graphics available in PowerPoint and Word to make these nice figures. Um, and so now we've listed actually some things that are inputs, some things that are activities. So that's good. Um, from those can flow some, some measures you might want to use. So this is better. The problem I have with it is it's still a siloed theory of change. So I have, a, I have a paper on theory of systematic reviews and actually a video on, on theory of change online um, from 3AE where I explain siloed theories of change and here's the inputs, here's the activities, here's the outputs and go from this to the other. And we don't really want that. We want to try and identify specific causal chains related to specific activities, activities and outputs having specific effects in terms of intermediate and final outcomes. Now, I've said that in my own theory of change for mentoring so far, I haven't got as far as I'd like with that unpacking because mentoring is a bit of a black box, um, but, I'm, but, I'm, but that's where I want to go. You want to actually be testing specific causal processes, not just mentoring has an effect, yes or no. So here's a, here's a third example of a theory of change, and this is, this is getting better. Um, so this, I, this is from a paper from Dubois, as reviewed by Dubois, but the framework is due to Rhodes. So Rhodes has written several papers on the, the theory behind uh, mentoring programs, and these three boxes down the middle, social emotional development, cognitive development, identity development, are the three sort of causal processes by which mentoring programs are assumed to have a beneficial effect. So you look at the most recent review by Raposa, she also lists these three mechanisms coming from uh, Rhodes' work in the early 2000s on identifying why we think uh, mentoring programs will work. And so here we've got mentoring relationship and they do pull out then mutuality, trust and empathy. So the quality of the relationship that develops between the mentor and the mentee and depends on that relationship, then you get social emotional development and cognitive development and identity development as important mediators leading to the final positive outcomes um, of better grades, improved uh, behavioural outcomes, and so on. The diagram also, so they're, they're mediators, they're, they're steps along the causal chain are the mediators. The, the other things along the bottom, in the grey box on the bottom, are the moderators. So moderators are things that affect the relationship. So the exist, existing interpersonal history, so existing social competences, development of stage of the child when they enter the mental relationship, all of these are going to, to moderate the, the effect of the programme. So it's not given here, the example would be duration. So the duration of duration or length has two aspects. One is the length of the meetings that they have each week, an hour or two hours, uh, and actually length, frequency, is it once a week, twice a week, three times a week, and duration of the programme. 
does the mentoring program go on for six months, one year, two years, whatever. And so all of that, that's really an important moderator. We expect the impact of the program to be different depending on duration of the program, particularly is it six months, one year, two years, or whatever like that. And I'll, I'll come back to that. So this representative theory of change is getting better. So we're starting to see sort of testable theories here. So I'm going, to, I'm going to identify three testable theories from this diagram, and then three testable theories in addition to that, I think I see in the literature, which are, I've been, some of which have been less, less tested. Oh, sorry, this one, this one looks better. So it's got theory tested, it's got research questions here, and it's got program design. So what are theories we testing? Here they are. So first is social relationships and emotional well-being. So, so the idea here is basically that by having a relationship with a mentor, the child learns to have trust in a relationship, and then that trust could extend to other relationships more generally. So it could be an improvement in family relationships um, through learning relationship with a mentor or with friends, other adults, and, and so on. So an improvement in the quality of relationships by uh, also, also improving relationships with peers by having, first of all, a good solid relationship based on trust, whereas maybe the child doesn't have any existing relationships based on trust, and so the relationships are quite antagonistic and, and withdrawn and not very close. And so that's not good for child's social emotional development and their well-being. And so getting one relationship in trust might should be beneficial to develop more relationships built on trust. Um, also, actually, it can be more direct. The mentor can just give advice on helping to improve relationships. So if a child's having trouble at school, they can give advice on that and how to try and improve relationships at school and so on. That's, a, that's the first theory being tested. So you can you, you've got the input there as a mentoring program, and then you're building trust with the mentor, and then you're building other trust with other people. That's what causal change you're looking for. Cognitive development. So it's important to realize that children in these programs are typically, and they can be young, but typically in teenage years. And children are still developing cognitively at that age. Cognitive development goes on into the mid-20s. And so it's this age when people, children start to develop the attitudes, their political attitudes, their sort of philosophy of life, how they're going to relate to the outside world, their future aspirations, and so on. And so by engaging with an adult that's got you know, a positive life experience to relate to, then this hopefully will help the, um, the child's own cognitive development develop in, in positive ways, developing positive attitudes and beliefs as, as a result, rather than, negative, rather than negative attitudes and beliefs towards life as a result of the, the support to cognitive development by engaging activities and um, ideas. Finally, is in identity development. This, this is probably the theory we, we think of most readily when we think of mentoring programs, is mentors as role models and advocates. So simply, it's a role model. The mentor is someone that the, the youth says, oh, well, they've done, they've done good stuff in their life. I'd like to be like that. Um, there's a key issue there, and it comes up a lot in the literature, is about, well, what sort of mentor do you want? Do you want a mentor who has a similar background to the youth, but they may be less likely to have achieved the things you want to be as role models? Or you have someone who's done very well in life, they're CEO of a big organisation or something, but the mentee can't relate to that. They don't think, they're not going to be like that, this, this guy you know, went to posh school and went to a posh university, and so I'm never going to be him. And so there's no, there's no possibility of identity. And so this is, a, this is one of the issues in, in matching the mentee and the mentor, to think about their practical issues in man, man, matching, like to have to live close to each other, but also other direct issues around, well, getting the theory of change to operate by making sure you've got the right match for identity development to um, take place. So it serves a role model to help shift the youth's ideas about what they might become, what they are, but their current identity, but also their future aspirations. So these theories have, have, not, have not been what I see as being tested in the literature. They, they serve as a framework the people don't then actually go back and say, okay, is this theory true or not? Does it hold? And they don't. Let's take an example of duration. So most of these, you'd think, well, certainly identity, all three of them actually, you'd think, well, duration of the program, both in terms of having longer meetings, but also in terms of um, the program going for two years, say, rather than six months, is going to lead to a larger effect, giving more time for these ideas to operate. 
What the reviews find is that actually duration of the program doesn't make any difference and short duration programs work just as well as long duration. Um, that's a puzzle. Some primary studies find long duration, long duration mentoring relationships do work better. And so some reviews say, well, so it seems that duration matters within a program, not between programs. That just doesn't make any sense. So I'm going to just not discuss it anymore. So what they, they also say is, well, what matters is if the duration of the program is as long as it was expected to be. If it's short as expected to be, then that can cause problems. But there's, there, there's no theoretical rationale for that. There's risk why it might be true, but not based on these theories. Uh, and so they sort of shifted the, rather than say, well, the theories, the theories don't seem to be working, but duration doesn't matter. Um, they don't go, they don't say, well, the theories seem to be wrong. Let's try and reformulate the theories to get something that's right. They just try and fiddle with them, the data, reinterpret the data, redefine the variables to find one that seems to fit the theories. That's what I mean when I say the theories haven't been really adequately tested. So maybe you know, mentoring does, does work overall, has a small effect size of 0.2 on average um, across all the reviews, but, but maybe across all the different kinds of outcome, but, but maybe it doesn't, doesn't work through these channels or only certain of these channels operate. It'd be good to know that because these do have applications for program, implications for program design, which become more obvious if you put the theory of change differently as I do a bit later on. Um, then here, I oh, said, so these, so these haven't been tested. So these, these are out there, they frame the analysis, they frame the programs, haven't really been tested. What we're also testing is three other elements. So one is st structure components. So clearly, I mentioned that you have a structure component or not, you can test whether that makes a difference or not. And that, that has been done, and it's done in the reviews. Next is diversion. I think diversion is under, I haven't seen it mentioned. I think diversion is an important element of mentoring programs. So diversion is, is two, takes two forms here. One is direct diversion. When the child is in with the mentor, they're not doing something else. They're not getting into trouble. And there may be indirect diversion because through the mentor, the child developed an interest in, in chess or in watching football games or reading books, whatever. Developed an interest in something else that also takes up their time rather than getting into trouble. If you read reviews of actually mentoring, not reviews, primary studies, qualitative studies, review of mentoring, but say after schools programs, the most common thing you find children saying or their parents saying is, oh, well, it's good to have an after school program so they won't get into trouble. Um, many years ago, I was a volunteer on what's called an intermediate treatment program, which was a, a diversion program for young offenders. And when the first evening there, we went round the, the room of the everyone saying why they were there, what they thought the benefit would be, and all the kids just said, well, while I'm here, I won't get into trouble. It's just simple diversion. In the two hours I spent here, I won't be breaking into a shop. Really, it's really as simple as that. And mentoring has the, the same, can have the same effect. But I think diversion is a missing element in the, in the theory of change that's been looked at so far. And, and the final one is connection to services. And this is mentioned in the studies, the primary studies, but doesn't come out in the reviews and doesn't come out in um, actually in the theory of change that they, they put forward. So these are, the, I mean, these are the, the previous theories about identity and, and so on, nice direct sociological theories. These are very practical things. Having a structured component where you learn something, diversion and connection services are sort of practical aspects of the theory of change. But these are still things that are testable in the way that mentoring programs might be working. So the mentor can actually just help the mentee apply for a job, write a CV, get an apprenticeship or an internship, or if they need social services of some sort, need mental health services, they can help connect them to them because you don't know where to go for these services. Their parents probably don't need to go. They, they're not engaged at school. And so having a mentor can actually help connect them to services. I think that's an important part of the theory of change. So here's my, so to say this haven't really been tested either. So, um, so the problem is existing evaluation reviews focus on what I call the first generation questions. Does it work? Does mentoring improve social emotional competencies, social skills, or does it improve school attendance? not second generation questions about does which design feature implementation issues actually matter to mediate the impact how is it we have a have a um have a good impact so so they look much more intermediate final outcomes and much less attention to what happens in the black box of mentoring progress process no studies no reviews that actually say well what the mentors actually do 
what in both from primary studies, what the mentors are actually doing with their mentees, um, what actually is the time use of mentees as during uh, but during mentoring, but also subsequent to mentoring, has there been indirect diversion? So there's very much, and this has been the thing that I work my whole career. I'm really a fan of looking at second moments rather than the first moment. I think the first moment is really the, the, the uh, parameter of most interest. So they focus on the first moment, the average effect sizes, rather than looking at exploring the variations in effect. And we learn much more from looking at the variances in the data than we do from just looking at the average across the whole of the data. And so both primary studies and reviews just don't do enough of that sort of analysis, which will help us unpack. So here's my theory of change. And I say this does look like a theory of change that I would have done before I knew the middle-level theory. I'm still coaching out the middle-level elements of this. Um, so, so I come back in six months, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe two or three. So, but we do have in this theory of change, a lot of theory of change just, just focus on the outcome side. So this one does say, no, hold on, you've got to assign mentors to the program, you've got to recruit and screen mentors, you've got to train them. Well, it's meant to be mentors, it's meant mentor training, sorry. You've got to train the mentors, and then you've got to match them with each other, and then the mentoring takes place. There may be a structured component. The mentor needs to be supervised in some way, and the evaluation show that the mentoring supervision is usually very weak. And then you get this set of intermediate outcomes, final outcomes, and then the delete was the outcome we're interested in. There are design choices here about matching process, uh, matching criteria, and characteristics and location. Then you've got Design choices around one-on-one -on -one versus group, structured or not, duration, um, nature of supervision. And then termination, I've not mentioned termination yet. So termination comes across very strongly in the qualitative literature as something that really matters. So children basically feel abandoned at termination. So I had this person I used to meet once a week and now there's just nothing, no contact whatsoever, which seems like just a seriously bad idea. And so you can actually reverse all the gains you've made during the mentoring program through a badly managed termination of the mentoring relationship. And so I've not seen a great discuss, I've not seen any study that evaluates different ways to manage termination, but clearly management of termination matters a great deal. Um, and then you've got implementation issues and other moderators, which are activities and quality monitoring relationship. So I've not got it here, because I, I just couldn't pick it. Um, like on theory of change number three, where they had the quality of the mentoring relationship as a separate box, that, which I think, probably should be because it's, it's the key next stage before you get to anything else. If you have a weak mentoring relationship, then nothing else really much matters apart from there might be some diversion, there might be some connection to other services, uh, but you're not going to get all these other these theoretical things around identity development, social emotional development and so on, are not going to happen. So, so these issues around design choices, implementation issues come back as being evaluation questions. <laughs> So what I'm trying to do is, is disentangle different causal pathways in this diagram. So here I'm just picking out a couple. So mentoring stays as a black box, but depending on what happens in it, um, if you've got the identification role model role, that can affect future expectations of a child and it can affect their school connectedness because they decide because they've got a role model, they're going to be more serious at school because they realize okay, I've got to do well at school and actually achieve what this guy has achieved. So I'm going to pay attention at school and so talk negatives improves. So because of that, disruptive behavior goes down, life satisfaction improves, so they've now got more positive goals, school attendance, school performance go up, and because of all those things, delinquency goes down. So there's one causal pathway that we could investigate. The second one's around connection to services, very straightforward one, mental connection to services. That can improve mental health and it can improve family social relationships and hopefully um, from the services we reduce disruptive behavior and then that reduces delinquency. Most of these outcomes are interconnected. I haven't shown in the diagram, I've shown a few of them. Most of the outcomes are interconnected with each other. So there's a second cause part, cause pathway we can try and disentangle in this diagram. Underpinning, underpinned by assumptions. If you connect to services, those services need to be available, for example, going back to my, my opening slides. So the implications for program design here, recruitment of both mentors and recruitment of mentors and, and, and matching of mentors matters. Attention to attrition. So from process evaluations, we know that there's enormous attrition in programs to the extent that review of, I think it was 80 
uh, mentoring programs by the Youth Justice Board back in the early 2000s found that 50% of the youth assigned to a mentoring program did not take part at all, and 50% of those assigned to the program and took part didn't complete the program. So only a quarter of kids assigned to a mentoring program actually completed the mentoring programs. Really high um, levels of attrition, which undermines effects, undermines cost effects, unless you've trained lots of mentors you don't then, then use because the kids have dropped out. Um, but also means you, these kids don't benefit, they're not, in, they're not in the program. And so identifying what causes attrition and tackling the determinants of, determinants of attrition to make it more likely that children take part in the mentoring program is, is key. And that's precisely something that both action research and adaptive learning impact evaluations can try and address. How do we simply reduce, increase take up mentoring programs? Very easy thing to do, a very quick impact evaluation. How do we just get more kids to take part in the, in the program? And that feeds back into program design. What sort of supervision is necessary for the mentors? I mentioned that process evaluations find support for mentors is normally quite weak. How do we support conditions to addition, connection to additional services? The mentor might play a role connecting to services, but then the mentor needs to know. So the, the mentoring program, the staff on the program, should be providing information to the mentor on how to connect to services that they can then use to advise the mentee. Um, there should be space for mentee feedback. That comes across in the process evaluations. It's very much a one-way process. And the, the trend in mentoring as a thing that's done in companies and in the army and so on, is very much now that mentoring is a two-way process. Both the mentor and the mentee learn from each other. I think it's only so far to which that's, that's true, but that's definitely the way the philosophy of mentoring programs is going. And you don't see that in the youth sort of mentoring programs at Youth at Risk. And I, I wouldn't go too far with that, but I do think there should be space for mentee feedback, not just in individual mentoring relationships, mentee mentoring relationships, but also in, in mentoring pro and mentoring program as a whole. Um, what supports going into structured components and how do you manage termination? Manage termination? There are lots of questions that arise from the theory as well. What should mentor training cover? What should be the pace of matching? Um, how best to manage matching activity? I won't go into the reasons for that. How to reduce dropout of mentees? What sort of supervision is required? Uh, what's the duration of mentoring sessions in the mentoring relationship? What do mentors do with their mentees? I think that's key. What in terms of quality of the, of the match and relationship? How best to manage termination? And no reviews, most primary studies analyze those questions. Some may mention them, but, oh sorry, there's cost effectiveness. Um, they might mention some of these questions, but other than the last two, they don't actually answer most of those questions. And they're, they're the questions that program managers would like to have answered. So what do you want to measure? Here's a whole list of things, I'm not going to read it out. Number four, quality of mentoring relationship. This is key. What is good is that um, one set of mature evidence architectures have a concept of indicators. And the US National Mental Resource Center actually has a measurement guidance, um, so it's called toolkit, I've got the wrong name there. Um, it's measurement guidance toolkit. And so this toolkit actually has a list of measures across a range of measurement domains. So here on the left here, is a list of domains they've got. Under each of those, they've got a range of measurement, measurement instruments. So here's the first domain is mentoring relationship quality, which is really key. And there are a number of questionnaires that exist in order to measure the quality of that relationship. Here's internet personal relationships, another domain. And here are a number of ways in which you can measure that relationship. I do want to mention this a bit because one of my great noirs is how badly measurement is done in most surveys. And people don't go back and look at what's been done elsewhere, just looking for validated tools. So I did work on a different intervention. I did work on a study some 25 years ago where we were interested in measuring trust. And what we found is that many, quest many surveys use a question like this. My mentor is someone I can trust. Yes, maybe, sometimes, no, never. This is just useless. Do not do this. Or they even say, how much do I measure, measure, trust my mentor on a scale of one to 10? Even more useless, because it gives a sense of false accuracy. Um, this is my leading question. So this is a bit better, because um, it gives, gives something a bit more specific. I can approach my mentor with problems, but you can't ask it baselines as no mentor, you can't ask a control group, the problem's unspecified, and it's still a leading question. I much prefer this, and this is how I would go about it. I would not, uh, this comes to the issue of blinding, preferably the mentor, the mentee, mentee when they're being 
question actually doesn't know you're evaluating the mentee relationship. They definitely would know it's a bit of research that's being done around their life in general. So they wouldn't get too close to the mentoring relationship. And you ask them, this is a question you also ask at baseline, um, if you've got into a problem at school, it's not a problem specific, I'll discuss the problem with, or who would discuss the problem with, and here's a list of possible responses, which you don't prompt unless you need to. If you do prompt, then you prompt multiple responses. You see if the mentor comes up. So I've done quite a bit of work on looking at influence, looking at influence on different processes. Uh, and this is the way to do it. You don't go and ask, did X influence your decision on this? You say, you know, how did you come to this decision? What, what other external actors did you consult? Who was influential in forming that decision? Same idea here. You don't want to leave the question. And also this helps identify if a baseline, they already had to have someone who could play the mentor role. So that there wasn't such a large role for the mentor, going back to the assumptions I had. Um, but what's happened in recent years has been a move to measure using what's called vignettes to measure things like this. Um, so this vignettes first came up in the health, health sector. So we used to use subjective health measures. I feel well or not well on a scale of one to 10. And they showed that Americans feel less well than anyone in the world. There's a famous study comparing Americans and Indians in Bihar, where Americans say they're far less healthy than people in Bihar, which is not clearly not true on any objective measure. And so in a, in a vignette, you tell stories about three people. Here's Alison's 13, finds school a waste of time. She's going to be excluded, she doesn't want to be, doesn't know what to do about it. She's in a mentoring program, but not going to discuss it with her mentor. She feels her mentor doesn't understand her, it won't, be, won't, won't help. There's 14, also problems at school, wants to do better. She's going to mention it to her mentor, but doesn't really expect much help from her mentor. They're going to mention it, unlike Alison, but doesn't expect much help. Cat is 13, going to fight at school, wants to know what, doesn't know what to do about it. She's going to, it's also in the mentoring program, she's going to talk about it with the mentor, and, and she thinks the mentor's going to be able to help. So here's three different vignettes, and the way you use this as a measurement instrument is you read them out to the respondent and say, here's three, these three girls, Alison, Bev, and Cat, which of these has the best relationship with their mentor? And of course, their mentor say, Cat has the best, Alison the least, and Bev's in the middle. And then you say, that doesn't always happen, but it usually happens. And then you say, well, how's your own relationship? Is it like Alison, Bev, or Cat, or maybe somewhere in between some of those? And then you've got what's called an anchored scale. So vignettes are for anchoring the measures. And so anchored scale, so when you've got a comparable measure between you, when they say, okay, I'm between A and B, it actually means something. The problem with vignettes, I've done news vignettes in non-professional India on looking at empowerment, um, they're very time consuming to administer. And so they're, they're difficult to use, but they are a very good way of trying to measure something like, like trust. And the very last part of the talk is how to analyze the data you've now got. So here's a bit of the causal chain. We've coded information around mental characteristics, mental characteristics, attrition, quality of the relationship, what they do during the recreation, uh, during the mentoring, social skills outcomes for the, ment for the mentee, relationship quality for the mentee, and social payment delinquency for the mentee. So here's a series of measures we've got from primary studies. And here we're doing a review. We've got N, N studies, N cases in our review. And what reviews typically do is what I call vertical synthesis. They say on average, the mental characteristics were 40% from black, Asian, mixed, uh, other uh, ethnic backgrounds, 20% uh, were under the age of five, 60% um, of parents were unemployed, 40% from single parent homes, and so on. They describe the mental characteristics. And I say the dropout rate was 30%. And mentoring activities, 50% spent time in cafes, 20% went to sporting events, and so on. So a series of vertical synthesis. You'll turn another alternative where you say, okay, here's a story of Alison, of course, Alison. Alison is, is white with a single mother who's unemployed, depending on benefits. Alison stayed with the program until the last month. She had, you know, good relationship, had some quotes from Alison. And so this horizontal synthesis is normally done in a qualitative case study, often in a box in the, in the report. And so, what most reports do is vertical synthesis, what I call sequential analysis of separate outcomes or successive vertical synthesis. 
And so they say, okay, well, we see you know, 50% of youth completed the program, social skills rose by 0.4 on this scale, delinquency fell by 0.2 on this scale, but they're not, they're not exploiting the fact there's a structure in this data by doing sequential uh, successive vertical synthesis. And when they look at a across a particular case, they're doing a separate qualitative case. But this model, model four, is a structural model. And every observation in there is a, is a, is a uh, observation that has observations across all the different variables in that model. So what we should be doing is actually estimating structural equation models using the data that, that contains the behavioral relationships in that model. Uh, you can rewrite this flow chart as, a, as an algebraic model. So you rewrite the flow chart as an algebraic model, and then you've got behavioral relationships embodied there, which we've measured the outcomes, and then we can parameterize it using structural occasional modeling. And that's, there, are, there is an area, meta-analytic SEM, there are textbooks on it, but it's very rarely done. There's no camp review that has done that, and no review in the area of mentoring that has done that. And then there are a lot of studies in mentoring. The most recent review by Repose had, I think, 79 studies. So there's a lot of studies out there where we can do this, and we can try and do some structural equation modeling, which is our, we're doing a review on mentoring, that's why I'm working on this, and that, that's our plan. So thank you. Um, come to the end, we have all take some questions, and some have come up. Um, uh, so here's some resources. We'll share the slides. And um, so here's we can look at um, the, the first are a couple of papers on middle level theory from this other program I mentioned, SEDL. Um, and then there's a couple of papers by my a few, a couple of papers myself on oh no, one another program SEDL by David Goff and others at the Epicenter, and then a couple of papers by myself also on causal chain analysis in systematic reviews. Um, so thank you. I realize I've just done. And I'm happy to take questions in the chat. I didn't say that, so I haven't been doing it, sorry. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. And um, I'm happy to take them. Oh, well, thank you, Michelin, for that. Um, so I have to take questions. The compliments are more than welcome. The questions also welcome. Yes, well, absolutely, so Serena. So I mean, depending on different interventions. So different mentoring programs can, and I can imagine that the the, um, the theory of change for say after schools programs might look quite similar to all the top end. So of course the bottom end, bottom end is a bit different. And certainly in the work we're doing with, with Youth Endowment Fund, which is why we're doing this work and Serena's from Youth Endowment Fund Foundation, um, then you see a lot of overlap in different interventions. So, so programs to prevent school exclusion, anti-bullying programs in school, um, trauma-informed approaches in schools, and vision mental health service in schools, there's enormous over, or rest of justice in schools, enormous overlap between what those programs just do. And, and so, for example, rest of justice uh, conference, sitting down to conference resolution conferencing. Um, so, so those sort of interventions are common across a wide range of different intervention types. And so you get a common theory of change emerging. And so um, something else I was looking at today um, also had mentoring as a component. So mentoring can be a component of other programs to clear this theory of change drops in. Okay. Well, I believe we're going to put the, the video up. We're going to put, we recorded the session, so we will put the presentation up so you can play it and try and run it a bit slower so you can hear me speaking at a normal speed. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, there's some, some question coming up. And uh, if you have any questions, we're going, to, there is a, I think, a common this chat, a question suggestion on YouTube. We might have disabled it because no one ever replies, but feel free to want the questions later. There is a, um, 
question here. I don't know if you can find my question on your personal level of service. Therapeutic alliance, actually, no, I didn't come across that. So the question on therapeutic alliance uh, as part of your trade. I don't remember coming across that term specifically, but I think as I unpack the, um, yes, so I'm still, still working on it. As we unpack the mentor mentee relationship more, that might come up as one of the aspects that people talk about. So we have got, there are around 78 year old studies, we haven't, and I'm just started, starting on it to develop this. So, and it, it might be there, but I haven't come across it to answer the question. The answer is no, I haven't come across it. That's not a guarantee, it's not there. Um, yes, do, do share with me what you've got on therapeutic alliances. Um, well, so the idea, I mean, the idea of high level theories is that they become too abstract to be testable. And I, my view is that the three theoretical explanations I mentioned at the start, um, of identity formation, cognitive development, social, economic, social emotional development, are getting a bit high end. And so it's getting a bit difficult to, to test them uh, in the way they've been formulated. And so I've done my best in the text I presented to present text coming from the original article by Rhodes to say how she, she uh, presented these, these, these theories. But to present them as something testable becomes, I, I think, a bit harder. And so I said they've not been tested, but I'm, I'm not convinced they're necessarily testable. And so they're, 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 quite high, they're quite high end. Whereas when you get down to the, the lower end, which I prefer to operate, it's much simpler to understand, then simple time use, diversion and time use, very simple to understand and very simple to measure. So, so no reviews have done this. There's, I have been looking to after school programs as well, which lies on my mind. There's an old review of our school programs in Campbell from 2008 or something, which does look at time use from after school programs, both in the, in the, in the after school program, but also subsequent to the program. And so I do think that's a, a meaningful theory of change to, to sort of something I can understand. And it's very sort of low level. So, so this, this, if you look at the top reference I gave you in, in the resources page, there's a paper on middle level theory by Nancy Cartwright. And so this tackle, and my own paper at the bottom of this as well, tackles very clearly this question. And the middle's quite big. It falls in a, across quite a wide range. Got one more minute for last question. Yep, another question come in. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Joseph. Welcome, Joseph. Okay, well, thank you all. Just a reminder, this is the first in the series of Campbell Webinar 2021. I think they are normally on whatever, this will be the second Tuesday of the month. So I think they're normally on the second Tuesday of the month that we can do it. Um, the programme is or will be online and they're sponsored by the American Institute, American Institute for Research. So thank you again to them for that. Thank you all for attending. Do tell your friends, family, what a great time you've had and do come along next month to attend. And um, look forward to seeing you then. Thank you and goodbye.